live from San Francisco, it's theCUBE, covering Red Hat Summit 2018. Brought to you by Red Hat. Hello everyone, welcome back. This is theCUBE's live coverage here in San Francisco of Red Hat Summit 2018. I'm John Furrier, co-host of theCUBE, with my co-host analyst this week, John Troyer, who's the co-founder of Tech Reckoning Advisory and Community Development Firm. Our next guest is Red Hash. Bala Krishnan is the general manager of OpenStack for Red Hat. Uh, welcome to theCUBE, good to see you. Great to be here. So OpenStack's very hot, obviously, with the, with the, with the trends we've been covering from day one. Been phenomenal to watch that grow and change. Um, but with Kubernetes, you're seeing cloud native, two robust communities. You got application developers and you got under the hood infrastructure. So congratulations and uh, you know, what's, what's the impact of that? What is, how is OpenStack impacted by the cloud native trend and what is Red Hat doing there? The best uh, epitomization of that is OpenShift on OpenStack. Uh, if you had caught the uh, keynotes earlier today, there was a demo that we did whereby we were spawning OpenShift on bare metal using OpenStack, and then you run OpenShift on top. That's what we kind of see as the normed implementation for customers looking to get to, I want an open infrastructure on-prem, which is OpenStack, and then eventually want to get to a multi-cloud application platform on top of it. That makes up the hybrid cloud Right, so it's a essential ingredient to the hybrid cloud that customers that uh, are trying to get to. And OpenShift's role in this is what? Um, I'm assuming you may ask about OpenShift. OpenShift Open will be multi-cloud from an application platform perspective, right? So OpenStack is all about the infrastructure. So as long as you're worrying about infrastructure, deployment, management, lifecycle, that's going to be OpenStack's remit. Once you're thinking about applications themselves, the packaging of it, the delivery of it, and the lifecycle of it, then you're in OpenShift land. So how do you bring both these things together in a way that is easier, simpler, and long standing is the opportunity and the challenge in front of us. So the good news is customers are already taking us there. And there's a lot of production workloads happening on OpenStack, but I got to ask the question that someone might ask who hasn't been paying attention in a year or so with OpenStack. Hey OpenStack, good, um, remember that, was, what's new with OpenStack? What would you say to that person if they asked you that question about what's new with OpenStack? Uh, the answer would be something along the lines of boring is the new normal. Right, we have taken the excitement out of OpenStack, you know, the conversations that are on uh, containers. So OpenStack has now become the open infrastructure that customers can bring in with confidence, right? So that's kind of the boring Linux story, but you know what, that's what we thrive on, right? Our job as Red Hat is to make sure that we take away the complexities involved in open source innovation and make it easy for production deployment, right? So that's what we're doing with OpenStack too. And I'm glad that in five years, we've been able to get here. Yeah, I definitely, I think, along with uh, boring goes clarity, right? Um, last year, uh, the Cube was at uh, OpenStack Summit. We'll be there again in two weeks so, uh, with you, and I uh, enjoy seeing you again. For it. The um, last year, there was a lot of you know containers versus there was some confusion, like to where people got sorted out in their head. Oh, this is the infrastructure layer, and then this is the app layer. I think now it, people have gotten it sorted out in their head. Op OpenShift on OpenStack, very clear message. Um, so a meeting of the community in two weeks. Um, can, any comments on the growth of the open, open stack community, the end users that are there, the, the depth of experience? It seemed like uh, last year was great. Everywhere for open stack on the edge, and, and you know, set top devices and pull top devices all the way to open stack in, uh, in private data centers and, and uh, for various security or, or logistical reasons. Uh, wh where is open stack today? Yeah, I think the key uh, phrase would be workload optimization. So OpenStack has now evolved to become optimized for various workloads. So NFV was a workload that people were talking about. Now people are in, uh, I mean, customers are in production across the globe, you know, be it Verizon, 
um, or the, some of the largest telcos that we have in EMEA and APAC as well, the fact that you can actually transform the network using OpenStack has become real today. Now, the conversation is going from core of the data center to the edge, which is radio networks. So, the fact that you can have a unified fabric which can transcend from data center all the way to a radio, and that can be OpenStack, is a, you know, a great testament to the fact that the community has rallied around OpenStack and you know, delivering on features that customers are demanding. Boring is the new normal, I love that, because boring implies reliable, no drama, clean, yep. uh, working. <laughs> if you had to kind of put a priority in, on, in a list of the top things just that are still being worked on, obviously the job is never done with infrastructure, you're always evolving, but DevOps certainly shows that with programmability. What are the key areas still on the table for OpenStack that are, that are key discussion points where there's still innovation to be done and built upon? I think the first one is, it's like going from a car to a self-driving car. How can we get that infrastructure to autonomously manage itself? We were talking about network earlier. Even in that context, how do you get to a implementation of OpenStack that can self-manage itself? So there's a huge opportunity to make sure that the tooling gets richer to be able to not just deploy and manage, but fine tune the infrastructure itself as we go along. So clearly, you know, you can call it AI, machine learning, implementation on OpenStack to make sure that the benefit is accruing to the administrator. That's an opportunity area. The second thing is the containers and OpenStack that we touched upon earlier. OpenShift on OpenStack in many ways is going to be the cookie cutter that we're going to see everywhere there's going to be private cloud. If you've got a private cloud, it's got to be an open shift or on OpenStack, and if it's not, I, I, I would like to know why. Right, it's a, 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 it becomes a de facto standard. Uh, you start to have enable, uh, enablement skills training for folks. As you talk to the IT consumer, right, the, the IT admins out there, you know, what's the message in terms of uh, upskilling and managing, say, an, an OpenStack installation, and, and what is Red Hat doing to help them uh, come along? Yeah, so the, those who are comfortable with RHEL, uh, Linux skills, are able to graduate easily over to OpenStack as well. So we've been missionarily focused on making sure that we are training the loyal uh, Linux install based customers. Um, and with the addition of the fact that now the learnings offerings that we have are not product specific, but more at the level of the individual can get a subscription for all the products that Red Hat has, you could get learning uh, access to learning. So that has helped make sure that uh, people are able to graduate or evolve from being able to manage Linux to manage a cloud and then face the brave new world of hybrid cloud that's happening in front of our eyes. Radesh, talk about the customer conversations you're having as the general manager of OpenStack Red Hat. Um, what, what are the, what's the nature of the conversations? Are they talking about high availability, performance, um, or is it more uh, under the hood about OpenShift and, and containers, or, or they range across the board depending upon the use cases? Of course they do range, but the higher order bit is that applications is where the focus is. Workloads is where the focus is. So the infrastructure, in many ways, needs to get out of the way to make sure that the applications can be moving from the speed of thought to execution, right? So that's where the customer conversations are going. So, which is kind of ties back to the boring is the new normal as well. So if we can make sure that OpenStack is boring enough that all the energy is focused on developing applications that are needed for the enterprise, then I think the job is done. Self-driving OpenStack means when applications are just running and that self-healing concepts you were talking about, automation is happening. Exactly, that's the opportunity in front of us, so you know, inch by inch, code by code, we will get there, I think. Uh, 
I, I love the demo this morning, which showed that off, right? Bare metal stack sitting there on stage uh, from different vendors, right? Actually, you're the, you know, OpenStack is the infrastructure layer, so it's, it's sat there with uh, servers from Dell and HPE and others, right? Um, and then booting up, and then the, the demo with, uh, with uh, Amadeus uh, showing you know, OpenStack and uh, public clouds with OpenShift all on top also showed how it fit into this, this whole multi-cloud stack. Is it, is it challenging to, um, to, to be the layer with the, with the hardware? Um, are, is hardware heterogeneous enough at this point that OpenStack uh, can handle it? Are there any issues there working with different OEMs? And if you look at the history of Red Hat, that's what we've done, yeah. right? So uh, RHEL became RHEL because of the fact that we were able to abstract multivarious uh, innovation that was happening at the x86 level. So being able to bring that for OpenStack is like you got to you know that's the right to swipe the uh, you know employee uh, card if you will right mm -hmm. so um, I think the the game is uh, going back to what uh, you were earlier talking about the game is evolving to now that you have the infrastructure which abstracts the compute storage networking etc how do you make sure that the capacity that you've created is applied to where the need is most right for example if you're a telco and if you're enabling 5G IoT, you want to make sure that the capacity is closest to where the customer pool is, right? So being able to react to customer needs or you know, the customer's customer's needs uh, around where the capacity has to be for infrastructure is the programmability part that uh, yeah. we, uh, you know, we can enable, right? So that's a fascinating place to uh, get into. Um, I, I know you are, technology users yourself, right? Yeah. So uh, clearly you can relate to the fact that if you can make available just enough technology for the right use case, yeah. then I think we have a winner at hand. Yeah, and take, as you said, taking the complexity out of it also means automating away some of those administrative roles and moving to the operational piece of it, which developers want to just run their code on. It kind of makes things go a little faster. And, and, and so, okay, so I, I get that, and I, but I got to ask the question that's more Red Hat specific, if you could weigh in on this, because this is a real legacy question around Red Hat's business model. You guys have been very strong with RHEL. The, the, the record speaks for itself in terms of warranty and, and serviceability. You guys give life. I mean, how many years is it now? Like a zillion years of support for RHEL. OpenStack is boring. Is Red Hat bringing that level of support now? How many years, because if I use it, I'm going to need to have support. What's the Red Hat current model on support? Um, in terms of versionings and the things that you guys do with customers. Thank you for bringing that up. Uh, what we've been consciously doing is to make sure that we have life cycle that is meeting two different customers uh, uh, segments that we're talking about. One is customers who want to be with the latest and the greatest, closer to the trunk. So every six months there is an OpenStack release, they want to be close enough, uh, they want to be consuming it, but it's got to be production ready in their environment. The second set of customers are the ones who are saying, hey look, the infrastructure part needs to stay there, cemented well, and then every maybe couple of years, I'll take a uh, re-look at you know, uh, uh, bringing in the new code uh, to uh, light up additional functionality around storage or network, et cetera. So, when you look at both the camps, then the need is to have a dual life cycle. So what we have done is, with OpenStack Platform 10, which is two years ago, we uh, have a up to five year uh, life cycle uh, release. So OpenStack Platform 10 was extensible up to five years. And then every two releases from there, uh, 11 and 12 are for just one year alone and then we come back to again a major release, which is OSP 13, which will be another five years. I know it can be- And they get the full Red Hat support that they're used to. That's right, so the idea is that you're able to either stay at 10, or you could be the one who is going from 10 to 11 to 12 to 13. There are some customers who are saying staying at 10, and then I want to go over to 13. And how do you do that will be industry first, and that's what we have been addressing from an engineering perspective. And that's differentiated too. I think that's a good uh, selling point. 
Um, congrats, that's always a great thing about Red Hat, you guys have good support, give the customers confidence. So you're not, you guys aren't new to the enterprise and, and these kinds of customers. So Red Hat, what are you doing here at the show? Red Hat Summit 2018, what's on your agenda? What's some of the hallway conversations you're hearing? Customer briefings, obviously some of the keynote highlights were pretty impressive. What's going on for you? It's all about OpenShift on OpenStack. That's where the current and the future is. And it's not something that you have to wait for. The reality is that when you're thinking about containers, you might be starting very small, but the reality is that you're going to have a reasonably sized farm that needs to power all the innovation that's going to happen in your organization. So given that, you need to have an infrastructure management solution thought through and implemented on day one itself. So that's what OpenStack does. So when you can roll out OpenStack, and then on top of it, bring in OpenShift, then you not only have to, uh, you're not only taking care of today's needs, but also as you scale, and back to the point we were talking about moving the capacity where it's needed, you have an elastic infrastructure that can go where the workload is demanding the most attention. So here's another question that might come up I want to ask you, and you probably got this, but I'll just bring it up anyway. I'm a customer of OpenStack, or someone kicking the tires, learning about deploying OpenStack. I say, Red Hash, what is all this cloud native stuff? I see Kubernetes out there. What does that mean for me vis-a-vis -vis OpenStack and all the efforts going on around Kubernetes and above in the application pieces of the stack? Right. Let's say if you looked at the rear view mirror five years ago when we looked at cloud native as a construct, um, the, the tendency was that, hey, look, I need to be developing net new applications. That's the only uh, um, a scenario where uh, cloud native would be um, uh, thought, thought of. Now, fast forward five years now, what has happened is that cloud native and DevOps culture has become the default. If you're a developer, if you're not sort of in that cloud native and DevOps, then you're working on yesterday's problem in many ways. So, if digital transformation is urging organizations to drive towards cloud native applications, then cloud native applications require an infrastructure that's fungible and elastic, and that's how OpenShift on OpenStack, again, coming back to the point, of that's the future that customers can build on today and moving forward so as well. You, so summarize, I would say, what I heard you say, and correct me if I'm wrong, OpenShift is a nice bridge layer, or not bridge layer, but a connection point. If you bet on OpenShift, you're going to have best of both worlds. Is that? That's a good summary, and you got to be, you know, betting on open, first of all, is the first order uh, uh, a bet that you should be making. Once you bet on open, then the question is, you got to bet on an infrastructure choice, that's OpenStack, and you got to bet on an application platform choice, that's OpenShift. Once you got both of these, I think then the question is, what are you going to do with your spare time? <laughs> Count all the cash that you're making from all the savings. Um, but also choice is key. You get all this choice and flexibility is a big upside, I would, I'd imagine. Redhash, thanks for coming on and sharing your insight on theCUBE, appreciate it. Thanks for uh, uh, letting us know what's going on and, and best of luck, see you in Vancouver. Thank you for having me. Okay, this is theCUBE live coverage here in San Francisco for Red Hat Summit 2018. I'm John Furrier with John Troyer. More coverage after this short break. <laughs>